Folks, the theme for this year's Investor Day is Think Big, Do Right, Make It Last. So Chi Kun told us about that earlier. One year on from the listing of CLI, our CFO and CEO are looking forward to sharing with you where they see the best opportunities for growth, for the company to grow for an, from an Asian real estate powerhouse into a leading global ream and also what the company is doing to prepare for a strong and sustainable future. To tell us more, please first welcome CLI's Group CFO, Mr. Andrew Lim. Thank you, Edward. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I've uh, been presenting quite a bit last few years and I can tell you with 100% certainty it is impossible to follow a bouncing colored ball with success. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, I know precisely what the four o'clock slot means to everyone. I will uh, try to keep it brief. Uh, I'm following what I hope is, um, has been a very informative, useful set of distinguished speakers. In a way, the way we set this presentation up is to um, amalgamate the thought leadership and the processes and the ideas that we were sharing with you today into um, distilling what we would like to share with you as far as a short-term plan to deal with VUCA and more importantly I believe a longer-term plan for how CLI will deliver shareholder value. Okay so uh, for section one I will use a phrase that uh, we use a lot at investment community, which is, we're going to take it as red. Uh, everyone knows uh, about the world today. I think we are all experts, unfortunately, with the, the troubles that are afflicting us as investors, as stewards of capital, uh, as stakeholders. And we thought we would spread this out into the short term, mitigants and what we see as CLI we can do to navigate through VUCA. Uh, but more importantly, and we talked about this earlier during the PE session, some of the mega trends that we see uh, as uh, thought leaders, as stewards of capital, and that we will continue to invest into uh, because we believe that this will see us being able to add value both to our partners, capital partners, and ultimately, of course, to CLI shares. So this is the taken as red section. Um, we've got a conflating set of geopolitical macroeconomic divergence. On the geopolitical side, Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, which is a euphemism for China versus the West. On the macroeconomic side, uh, we've got the makings of a very serious trade war. Um, we've had a second order spillover, as we, we saw today from OPEC, uh, and oil prices, and that spilling off into the weaponization of energy. And we seem to see central banks around the world acting in an increasingly uncoordinated uh, fashion as they look out for their own self-interests. So all this is adding to a lot of global financial stress. Again, uh, interest rates are at an all-time high. We haven't seen rates at this level since 2008. That is a long, long time. I think longer than many of us have uh, been in this business. Headline inflation is at a 40-year high in the US and at a record high in the EU. We have an index here that we borrowed off that measures financial stress, looking at credit, equity valuations, safe assets, funding, volatility. And as you can see, after obviously the COVID period where it shot up, it went back down as, as we were coming out of it and getting ready for recovery. And now we are starting to see that above the zero line again. We are all stressed out. And you can see how that is being reflected in major equity markets around the world. So what do we do about this uh, in the short term? And what do we think at CLI we need to do to navigate through VUCA? Uh, lots of little tactics and strategies that we debate on a daily basis with management and the board. We've, I've chosen to highlight four things that I think are of particular relevance. The first of these is, uh, you know, no surprise, fiscal discipline and resilience. Um, Unfortunately, this is something we have to revisit again very quickly. We went through this in 2020, um, where we, we had the darkest days of uh, COVID, and we were working very closely with the board to make sure that um, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns were as thoroughly studied and stress-tested as possible 
so that we were sure we could face investors, our stakeholders, our vendors, our customers with the confidence that we could navigate through a high period of uncertainty. And so what I'm trying to demonstrate to you here is that the balance sheet is strong. We have uh, ample cash throughout the group. At Treasury at Group, I have about just over, just under two billion of Sing dollars uh, that we are ready to use to deploy, to navigate, as well as to take advantage of opportunities that may come our way. I'll talk a little bit about that later. The gearing is running nicely at 0.5. This is on a consolidated basis with, AR, uh, with class uh, and uh, uh, CLMT uh, as part of the balance sheet. If I take that down, if I deconsolidate that, the actual treasury gearing is uh, 0.4. So that gives us a lot of headroom to deal with uh, what we need to do in case we need to raise liquidity on a short-term basis. The rest of the credit metrics, including our percentage of fixed rate debt and our interest costs are benign and we believe will continue to be relatively more attractive than many of our peers, and that's the key. Absolute interest rates may be rising, but if we are able to deliver lower cost of funding vis-a-vis -vis our peers and our competitors, that leaves us in a competitive position of advantage, and that's a key point. The second thing is about portfolio repositioning, and John talked a lot about this uh, in his section. I think when you have a period where uh, people are concerned, people are, are nervous about what to do and where to spend their time, what real estate to uh, spend their time in, what real estate to buy in, they will gravitate to things that are safe, gravitate to things that are best in class, gravitate to things that are high quality. And what I'm trying to show you here is that throughout the group, throughout our sectors, throughout our products, throughout our countries, we've been very busy in the last few years actively enhancing the quality of the global portfolio, wherever it may sit, whichever product, whichever country. So whether that is a new project development, for example, with Canning Hill Pierce here in Singapore, which uh, is going to come under class, uh, whether it is uh, uh, CLAR uh, redeveloping Science Park 1 together with our sister company, CLD, uh, whether it is CLAR also, again, John talked about uh, converting San Diego, we talked about Life One North, uh, and then a whole host of different projects across India, China, the US, Singapore CBD, and Clark Key, which is again a direct output of COVID and what we felt we needed to do with Clark Key to uh, build a more re resilient night spot, day spot. You see evidence of the outcome of this asset enhancement, and I hope you can see the slides, if not, please. Uh, download the deck and, and have a look at it. You see direct outcomes as a result of AEI, and then John talked about uh, that example as well. So I think this is an important aspect. It doesn't get the recognition it deserves, but it's a very day-to-day, -day, very intensive asset management exercise that all of us do in all of the countries, where we are always looking to further uh, value create throughout the group in the assets that we manage, either on balance sheet or more importantly, on behalf of our capital partners. 75 properties in total have undergone AEI or redevelopment in the last 12 months. That's a fair number in a 12, relatively short 12 month period. <coughs> number three, and this is an important one, I like to talk about capital pool diversification. The situation now is that we seem to have a mismatch of opportunities with capital. You need to have capital and opportunities come together in order to deploy and in order to then uh, work for you. And because of geopolitical risk, geopolitical tension, we are now seeing that link being broken principally with the US dollar capital pool and with opportunities that we are seeing come out in markets like China, where there's a lot of opportunities emerging because of China's specific situations. So the way to manage through this in our view is to diversify the capital pool. We currently have a large US dollar capital base through our US dollar partners. We have a very large Sing dollar base through our REITs, but we don't have what I believe is enough of a local capital pool. And this is where we took the decision to start to build up local uh, pools of capital in some of the countries that are very important to us. We have a very decent presence in Korea because we have a local AMC, and Matt will be happy to talk you through uh, if, you, if you speak to him about it. We have a total of eight private equity funds in Korea managing uh, WON for local partners. And that's a 
franchise that we're very proud of. It came uh, together with Ascenders. And we've now realized that there's a lot of value to be built with the Korean AMC franchise. We are early days into doing the same thing with the Yen Capital Pool in Japan. Lysing has just launched the first fund earlier this year, a small fund, but it was a big step for us because we were able to tap local Yen capital. And by far, the largest elephant in the room is RMB. And I think Simon talked a little bit about this. This is where we see the most opportunities coming out of the current situation in China. There's opportunities to acquire assets at good values because of the disruption and the dislocation that is happening for one reason or another. And because we have boots on the ground, because we have track record, we have access to relationships, and quite frankly, we are there when many of our peers are not, we can move quickly to establish a, a first-in look at these assets and the ability to execute fast. But if the US dollar capital is not there, then we have broken the, the link between capital and asset opportunities. So we want to have a, a third uh, capital pool in addition to Sing dollars through CLCT and US dollars through our existing funds. The third capital pool that is absolutely critical for us is RMB. And if we have an RMB license, which we now do, we are able to now go out and reach out to the likes of Ping An, the likes of the local AMCs, uh, asset management companies, insurance companies, pension funds, as a trusted advisor, as a trusted steward of real estate. And we have the track record, we have the presence, we have the relationships to do so. So this to us, if you will, is a, an ability to mitigate the geopolitical risk that we see from the previous slide. If the tension builds and we start to see real decoupling from capital flows, this will give us a very important leg to continue to grow our presence in China and make full use of the track record and access that we have in, uh, quite frankly, our second largest market today. So this is to us a key step in how we navigate through the current uh, situation. Elevator VUCA, you should expect to see more such product from CLI. And then uh, finally, patient capital deployment. And it's something that Chikun talked about this morning when we kicked off. We're not gonna grow for the sake of growing and putting out a headline to say we hit our 10% you know, growth in FUM. If the opportunities are not there to add value for our capital partners in the long term, we're not gonna do it. But what you do wanna do when you have a high period of uncertainty is you wanna have dry powder and you wanna be ready to make that powder count because this is the time when opportunities start to show up. And we've seen this through previous crises. Companies and investors were able to act decisively, act nimbly, move fast and execute with the right investment ideas, able to then enjoy exponential returns as they reap the rewards down the road. So this is all about having A, dry powder to deploy, okay, and I talked about our leverage, but B, and equally important, being patient about it. Let's not be in a rush to pull the trigger is something that we hear a lot from Chikun, right? He's told our IMs, told our REIT CEOs, if it's not there, if you don't have that buffer, then don't be in a rush to do it. Because the last thing you wanna do is you wanna, make, you wanna make a mistake right now. People are watching, we have a track record we need to build, and more importantly, we are stewards of capital. So you have to do the right thing as per our mission statement. But what this tells you is we have, hit, we have dry powder and we will deploy it at the right time. I've got 3.7 billion roughly of dead headroom if I think about my gearing at 0.4 and what I consider to be a comfortable level of 0.7. When we combined with Ascenders, we took the gearing up to 0.83 with a commitment to bring it down again below 0.7 and we did that. So I'm, with 0.7, I'd say it's actually pretty conservative. But given this environment, let's say it's 0.7. So we do the math, given our headroom uh, equity base, it's roughly about 3.7 billion. In the next three years, assuming we roughly recycle 3 billion a year, gross proceeds, which is our, which is our uh, stated public target, we will generate about 6 billion of net proceeds. Okay, again, this is a conservative number. If I add that together, that gets me about 10 billion of capital that I will have. And if I apply a Again, a conservative capital efficiency uh, ratio of 10. So every dollar I earn, I can manage $10 in FUM. That gives us about 100 billion in potential FUM that we will have the ability to access and manage in the next three years. So this is powerful dry powder 
again, that we will be patient about deploying. Number three is embedded FUM. I think most of you know about this. We started to show you this in the first half. Of the 86 billion of current FUM, it does not include three and a half billion of what I call committed but yet to be deployed capital, which largely sits under Simon today. So he's got committed capital from existing funds that have yet to be deployed. So this is dry powder. And then last but not least, under the auspices of capital deployment and capital management, a lot of investors have asked us about share buybacks, and um, we see the value of share buybacks at the right time, obviously when we believe that the share price is undervalued, number one, and secondly, if we feel that we have the liquidity to spend to buy back shares. We have been quite modest in our share buybacks. We've only spent about 133 million, buying about 35 million shares. So given the current mandate that you have given us, we still have a lot of headroom to continue to buy back shares when we feel that it is appropriate to do so. So this is a, a tool on capital management that we will deploy when we feel the time is right. Okay, so I think those are the four things that you, you can look from us to do as we figure out what VUCA is doing to us. And this is again, no crystal ball, a highly uncertain, ambiguous, complex, volatile environment. I didn't get the letters right, but it spells VUCA in some fashion. Um, let's see, let's see how this plays out. Uh, one thing you can rely on from us is we communicate and we will tell you what we are doing. We don't hide and we don't obfuscate, okay? Uh, next section, uh, some of the themes that you would expect us as thought leaders, as uh, stewards of capital, as people with long-term track records, with people on the ground in our markets, to be able to provide to you as investment themes. Okay? And some of these, I'm very happy to say, were already discussed this morning, so there is an alignment. I would be very nervous if this morning's investment themes were completely different from the ones I'm about to show you. So I'm very relieved about that. These are the seven that we've uh, more or less uh, landed on. And I'll walk, this, I'll walk through these uh, in, uh, as efficiently as I can. The first of this is recalibrating retail. The chart that we've cho chosen to show you about retail is the penetration of e-commerce in some of the largest markets, uh, retail markets. Obviously, the ones that are important to us are China and Singapore, which is where we have our retail. Apologies to Chun Xiang. So uh, what you see is um, in the last four to five years, first of all, this huge wave of e-commerce. And what has happened is that has normalized. The belief that bricks and mortar would be replaced by e-commerce is, I think, no longer the conventional thinking. And that the conventional thinking now in terms of retail is that there will be a coexistence between uh, digital and bricks and mortar. And as long as you have the right product in the right location, in the right catchment area, with the right tenant mix and trade mix, then you have a product that is going to be resilient and in demand, particularly in China and Singapore where we have focused our attention. I think Singapore has managed its retail GFA very well. Supply is basically non-existent, and it's all about making sure you have the right product in your catchment areas. And in China, we've pared down the portfolio. I should flip the page. In China, we have pared down our portfolio, focusing on the malls that we believe have that ability to be resilient and sustain us uh, in our, as we grow the presence of our retail presence in China. We have divested non-core assets. You will remember we used to have a fairly large retail uh, exposure. We sold our retail malls in Japan. We've sold off some retail in Singapore. We continue to sell off non-core retail and recycle that capital. And again, as you saw, uh, we are undertaking AEI to get our portfolio into a position where we believe it continues to drive sustainable competitive advantage. On the right, given what we believe to be a coexistence between digital and physical. So the digital capital star, I'm very proud to report, is still driving strong membership growth as well as GTO sales. We have a total number of 1.5 million members in Singapore, which is roughly, I don't know, 20, 20, 25% of the population of Singapore today. So that's a decent number for a retail loyalty platform. And Chris Chong, please take a bow. Total number of sales generated, almost 900 million, which is not a small number 
running through our, our digital platform. In China, we have 16 million members, which in percentage terms is very small, but it's the largest pure retail platform, uh, digital platform that exists in China, running at about 465 million RMB. So for us, we see that we have a repositioned and resilient retail portfolio. For those of you who are concerned about retail, it's not US retail, it's not Australian retail, it's Singapore and China retail. And this is where we have a best-in-class platform that we are, we are fully confident will continue to grow and add value. Okay. Second one is evolution of the workspace. Uh, this was, it says I've got eight seconds. I don't think that's correct. Okay. <laughs> not that long, right? Come on. So, um, where was I? Okay. So, uh, eight seconds. Um, this was the question during COVID that actually caused us the most concern. It wasn't hospitality because we knew that once assuming COVID would settle down, people would travel again. There's no substitute for it. And that is coming to pass. It's actually a mega trend. I'm going to show you that in a second. The one that really caused us headaches was where is workspace going? Because everyone was working from home due to necessity. And then all of a sudden we discovered that we could. So the question started to come and say, okay, what happens when we can go back to the office, but actually we don't have to. And we had a hard time addressing this across the platform. No one really knew what the answer was. Now, I think we've moved that uh, narrative and debate and, and that point to a place where I think most of us believe the landing point is flexible workspace. If you sample most of your colleagues, they'll tell you that there is a time when I want to be in the office. There's a time when bosses need their teams to be in the office. But there are also times when I very much appreciate the flexibility and ability to work from home. And sometimes I'm actually more productive when I work from home. So for us, for landlords, we have to figure out how to deliver flexible workspace solutions. Hybrid, hub space, hub spoke, co-working, all of these things are coming to pass. And again, I'm happy to report that we have in our markets the ability to offer this product. So we have a, we have a business park portfolio. We have an office, a great A CBD office portfolio that we're very proud of in our core markets. Uh, making up a substantial uh, percentage of FUM and contribution to EBITDA. And we have an in-house co-working brand, two of them actually, that are occupying now 22 offices in our platform. So the idea is to take this to our core tenants and say, listen, you want to do hub spoke, we help you. You guys want to do co-working, we can help you. You guys want to do downtown CBD, you need to maintain a presence. We are the number one CBD landlord in Singapore and in we have a very strong landlord in uh, tier one China markets. So I think as we start to see more proof that workspace will land on hybrid and flex, we are positioning a portfolio and we are investing into a flexible workspace portfolio that allows us to cater to this mega trend. Number three is the return of international travel. Uh, Siu Kim got the great slide. She gave me the shitty one. But the message is the same, that by 2025, uh, we are back to pre-COVID for all of these, uh, the entire footprint. Um, but what has changed post-COVID is that is there's an emphasis on quality, emphasis on safety, emphasis on length of stay, uh, being able to do short and long. And this again, if you look at where our strengths are, we have a global footprint with a family of brands that is known to many of our business and increasingly um, personal customers and travelers. So they come to an escort, they come to a Citadines, they come to a Somerset, they know what level to expect. I think someone said it on the lodging panel today. It's that sense of place and the fact that, uh, I think it was Fritz that said that one of the problems is the standards are starting to vary, right? You go to a, a brand in one country, you go to a brand in another country, it doesn't feel the same brand. So I think Kevin and his team are very clear about what it is we need to offer, particularly in the post-COVID environment, where if you're going to bring your family somewhere, you are going to choose a Somerset, it's because you know that it, I'm going to get a certain level of care, I'm going to get a certain level of service that I feel comfortable taking my family into. And there's no higher endorsement 
than a place that you feel that you can bring your family to stay in. And that, I think, is the ultimate test. So what we've done here is we're really scaling the lodging management platform. We believe there's a very strong tailwind post-COVID. There is revenge travel, but there is also proof that people are, uh, will continue to travel post-COVID. There's also proof that businesses are traveling. We weren't sure if after the uh, era of, of teams and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth, that businesses would sanction business travel. That is also out the window, notwithstanding ESG concerns. We are all, I'm sure, traveling extensively now because we see the virtue of physical meetings at the right time and when it is called for. So I think there is a strong cyclical tailwind when it comes to uh, accommodation. And we believe we offer a very compelling product that is battle tested through COVID, as Kevin mentioned. So this is something that, again, in hindsight, when we got asked whether why is lodging part of CLI, and we had to so, do so much explaining, we're absolutely delighted that we can now point to LM, lodging management, as a key competitive differentiator for CLI. Very few REAMs have this, and it generates fee income for us. And as we scale, as we grow to 160,000 and beyond, we get a expansion of EBITDA margin from scaled economies. That's going to start flowing through to the bottom line. And those of you who pay attention to that will start to see it make a meaningful contribution, particularly in the backdrop of a cyclical recovery in lodging. So we're very excited at this mega trend. <clears throat> uh, next one is demographics. Uh, again, I think um, it was George that talked about this, where he said that they might have missed it. Uh, I'm sure they haven't. He's being modest. Uh, the grain population is something that we all know about. And at the same time, our Gen Zs and our Millennials are now starting to come into the workforce. And as we all know, they are very different from us. They have their own um, preferences. They have their own priorities in life. They have their own aspirations. And if you're going to cater to these guys, we have to figure out what it is that is important to them and build real estate product and manage real estate capital to cater to this very fast growing slice of uh, the, the population. So what are the key opportunities that we see given a growing population and an increase in the emergence of Gen Zs and millennials coming into the workforce? Number one is I think there is the need to preserve and uh, um, plan for wealth. You're going to want to save. You're going to want to be able to live comfortably in retirement as you approach your uh, senior years and you're going to be leaving the workforce. We have to have products that allow them to do this. And then for the Gen Zs and the Millennials, one of the key trends that we are seeing, and as we talked about at the lodging session, is that they like to share stuff. They don't necessarily like to buy stuff. They like to share. And this is where co-living turns up. So uh, I won't get into details, but we, we saw, again, that we are the largest S-suite manager in Singapore. We have demonstrated track record growth of uh, FUM, and I think that speaks to the strength of the management teams, the discipline in how we are growing our REIT franchise. We now have a unity of <coughs> branding that we are still getting used to, and I'm sure you are as well. But I think this, uh, to the point that was made by Bun Jin about the regime in Singapore, if you deliver safety and the belief that your money is protected from a regulatory standpoint, uh, and that the level of governance is high, if you're looking to preserve your wealth, this is the kind of jurisdiction that you want to park your money in. So I think it actually resonates very strongly with why um, S-REITs have been successful and why we have uh, five out of our six REITs that have uh, done very well with Singapore as their home. We will want to bring this model into other Asian countries because we believe the need is the same. So uh, one of the things that I think is in the strategy, mega trend, is if we have growing populations in China, growing populations in Japan, there is ample opportunity to see whether we can bring the capital and brand, the capital and track record into these markets. And again, I go back to the CRE potential that I think Derek raised. 
I won't spend too much time on this to say, except to say that the rental housing uh, space is something that we've grown very quickly, as well as co-living to cater to Gen Zs and Millennials. If you um, have been to a life, life is our fastest growing lodging brand. Um, if you have been to a life with 12 square meters and you don't get it, then you are in the wrong demographic. <laughs> but don't feel bad, because I don't get it either. Uh, but there is a whole bunch of guys who get it. Uh, and if you look at the occupancy rates and the ADRs, they have the means to afford it, and they, act, they like that ability to cohabit and share experiences uh, with a very small living space, and the bulk of their time is spent together. So this is something that I think Full credit to the lodging team for catching on to this concept early. We are one of the first movers into co-living and we are rapidly building this out with owners who get it and understand the potential of this brand. So I think this is something that you can look for more to come in this very exciting co-living space that caters to this very fast growing demographic. Uh, next trend, getting to the end soon, um, urban migration. Okay, so we talked about, uh, Patrick talked about population in Asia. Um, it's not only just large numbers, but it's the sustained rate of urban migration, which is where CLI plays. Okay, we don't, fortunately, we don't, we are not in the rural areas, we're in urban centers. And if you look at our core markets, China, India, uh, Southeast Asia, which includes Vietnam and Singapore, the pace of urban migration is not expected to diminish anytime soon. There is still a long secular trend of urban migration. And then what do you need to do to succeed to capture this trend of migration? You need presence on the ground. You need a track record. You need the ability to be there, so to invest in and unearth opportunities to capture this migration. And again, the core markets that you see before you are where we have 20 to 30 years of experience successful track records, building relationships, building access to opportunities that will allow us to continue to capture this secular trend. Okay, second last one is supply chain and data fragmentation. This is again a byproduct of what's happening with VUCA. Uh, people, manufacturers are no longer uh, content or cannot afford to rely on the lowest common, cheapest manufacturer anymore because that cheapest manufacturer may not be there for you, either through their will or yours. You have to establish a second chain, some perhaps even in your home market. So there's a whole thing of reshoring going on. There is a whole, uh, underpinned by potential decoupling politically. That's the supply chain side of the equation. On the mobile data side, the demand for data, I think we all agree, is secular and a mega trend, but there is increasing nationalism and concern about where that data sits, who has access to it, and who owns that data. So there is a, you need to have a local presence on the ground. You need to have, again, access to regulators, relationships, and a clear definition of who owns that data so you do not stray offside. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but we've actually been quite stealthily building up a decent data center portfolio. This is our global DC map. We have about half a gig of megawatts uh, on a completed basis representing about six billion, again, on a completed basis. Here is where it sits, right? We are global, and it sits in multiple vehicles. We have over 50 data center professionals that are involved in the management, the design, the operations, customer support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have the makings of a global DC platform that will allow us to capture some of this uh, growth in data of which is coming but increasingly the nationalism and the desire to house data in your home countries. To deal with reshoring and the decoupling of supply chains, uh, again, we are building a fast-growing diversified logistics platform. I think most of us will admit that we are a little bit late to the game, but thanks to Ascenders and the combination in 2019, we got ourselves a presence that was meaningful, and we are taking steps to sort of catch up Bearing in mind that logistics in the last couple of years has been a very expensive price to perfection sector. And so the way that we want to take this forward is if you look at the number of vehicles that are investing in logistics, 
we've got three REITs that are uh, acquiring, still successfully able to acquire logistics at the right price in selected markets. But we also equally have a private equity product that is investing in development, greenfield logistics development, multiple geographies. We are going up the value chain, investing earlier because we do believe in the secular trend, but we have to find an, in, an entry point that works from a returns perspective. So this is the strategy through multiple vehicles that we intend to continue to invest in what we believe to be an important mega trend. Last point, and I won't belabor this, you've just had a fantastic presentation from Vince. Um, what I would like to just add is that if you look at the four stakeholders, I think since I started working at CLI uh, or CL in 2017, the, the sense that the stakeholder community is finally coming together to recognize the existential importance of doing something about it. And as Vince said very eloquently, uh, it's not someone else's problem. It's actually our collective problem. We need to address it. And I'm seeing this happen uh, in my engagements as CLI representatives uh, reach out to various stakeholders. There is a willingness to come together. There's a willingness to put capital to work. There's a willingness to engage regulators and various stakeholders to solve an existential problem. The opportunity for us, as Vince said, is that in CLI's own personal journey, I think we are a leader given that we started early before it was fashionable. And we are pushing that line where we, it's going to become a competitive advantage for us, both as an operating business, but potentially down the road as a manager of capital in the ESG space. So this, I think, is something that hopefully we are able to bring to you in the not too distant future. So those are the seven mega trends um, that you should see us continuing to focus time, energy, capital, reaching out to you as our capital partners on. We hope you agree with us, and if you disagree, that's fine. But we would like to have a discussion with you on to why you, we believe this is secular, this is a mega trend, and it is worth putting capital to work with these, uh, with these ideas. I'll just take five minutes to finish up uh, and to leave you all with a timely reminder that we are in our first year of a multi-year journey, right? We were not so long ago that we celebrated our first year anniversary as CLI. So I know all of you are impatient. I know all of you want to see EPS growth. I know all of you want to see FUM growth. We would love to give it to you. Um, but just remember that we are in a very uncertain time. And I, again, repeat the overlay from uh, Chikun and the board that it is not growth for growth's sake. We are being very mindful and careful about the desire to deploy capital to work for you. Next three years, uh, sources of funds, as I said earlier, that was the dry powder. I think we'll have more than 10 billion to be able to be used for the following uh, uses. Um, I'm going to start this, the, the, the easy stuff. Dividends, OK, a lot of questions. Dividends will continue to be a key part. We will seed new product working with Patrick and Simon. We will put skin in the game because that's what you've told us you need. We will support our REITs when it comes time for Pro Rata to support, to demonstrate alignment of interest, uh, which is very important in the SREIT space. We will invest in lodging because it's a mega trend and we want to scale lodging as quickly as we can because the faster we scale, the faster we get margin growth and the faster that flows to the bottom line. If we need to, we will buy shares back if you, as you know, as you've seen. We will asset warehouse when it is required, but we will be very disciplined about doing so because we believe that in warehousing that asset, it is future FUM that will come off the balance sheet as quickly as possible. And we will ensure that it earns a commensurate capital return for us as stewards of, share, of capital that you have given to us. And last but not least, uh, M&A is something that uh, we are looking very intently at. It is going to be a key part of our strategy to accelerate growth. M&A, as you all know, doesn't grow on trees. Uh, it comes when it comes, and it's lumpy. It's fraught with even more uncertainty, and most M&A doesn't go well. And so we will be careful when we decide on something that uh, allows us to maximize our ability to deliver shareholder value. 
for those of you who have engaged with us on one-on-one, -on -one, you'll know that we've taken a look, some serious looks uh, this year, and we decided not to pull the trigger for various reasons. And looking back, we made the right call. So again, working closely with the board and our various teams, we are on the lookout, turning over stones everywhere to see whether something fits. And if we can make it fit and it will add value to our platforms, we will do that. We have the dry powder to do that, as you saw. Last slide. Okay, multi-year journey of growth. We are in our first year. We've launched one year ago. Uh, and when we launched, um, we are now focused very much on resource and capability building. So we are still in launch phase. We have two new platforms. Uh, as someone mentioned, 50% of our business is fairly new. And so the time is now when we are putting teams together in research, in private capital markets, in portfolio management. Country teams are being built out uh, to ensure that we have the right hunters on the ground, the right asset managers to deliver on the underwriting. But this is gonna take some time to gel. In the last year, we have launched seven new funds, which is pretty decent for a one-year startup company. We are managing 1.4 billion in that funds. It's not a big number in the grand scheme of things, but we are one year into this program. 152,000 keys under management since launch, post acquisition of Oakwood. As we gain momentum, the target, as we've shared with you, is 100 billion in organic FUM by 2024, and 160,000 keys of lodging under management by 2023. We remain confident that we will hit these targets. Now, it may not come in neat packages where every year I show you 8%, 9%, 8%, 9%, because of what we are seeing today, okay? And then post meeting that target, we believe in three years or less, I think we hit this scale uh, of exponential growth that Chi Kun's talked about, where we can renew our targets for FUM growth. We will have the benefit of scale-driven FRE and EBITDA margin growth, and we will be able to continue to demonstrate to you that we are recycling capital effectively. When we launched our EBITDA, operating EBITDA contribution from our fee income business, compared to the balance sheet, was 2080. The short-term target as we gain momentum is to hit 4060, and the long-term target is to get to a balanced contribution from fee income and the balance sheet. And then that's another strategic crossroads which we will take with the board when we get to there. I have cheekily put in the five-year interest rate uh, that many of our banking partners currently are forecasting. Uh, if you map this out and this comes to pass, then the timing actually is quite interesting for us because this is that period now we have to navigate through a period of uncertainty, but we've got the dry powder that will allow us to invest into the right product, into the right investments, following our mega trends. And if we do it well, it will accelerate that scale when interest rates and the economic environment improves. The three wild cards are m and as I talked about, the economic cycle, which we have no control over, and the geopolitic, geopolitics, uh, which uh, can either work out to everyone's benefit or we put our pens down and start to take care of our families. So these things are existential. These things are beyond our control. Um, we can only hope for the best, prepare for the worst, which we are very good at doing, trust me. So I think on that note, I will end my presentation. I don't know how far long I've spoken. I'm sorry if I've taken up too much time. It's uh, four-ish. Um, I, I'm going to invite our CEO to come up and um, he's going to answer all the questions that you have. <laughs> Thank you.